Hey everyone, welcome to the Lunarverse. I'm Dr. Charles Liu, your host, and of course, you should always call me Chuck. Welcome back to part two of our time with astrophysicist Yun Wang and Midge Goldberg and our wonderful co-host, Alan Booth. I highly recommend checking out part one if you haven't already, okay? All right, let's pick up right where we left off. The luminous spheres. I, I, I just remember when I heard you talking about luminous spheres, it took me only a moment to realize you were talking about standard candles. And But the standard <laughs> candles I thought you were thinking about were a little bit different. Because um, for those of you in the audience who don't know that history, uh, Edwin Hubble used a kind of standard candle known as a Cepheid variable star to actually measure the distance to the Andromeda galaxy. So I thought you were planting Cepheids to try to show that there was, in fact, the actual distance to Andromeda, which we today have measured to be about 2 million light years. But Hubble got it wrong because he didn't know specific details about the Levitt law that explained the uh, Cepheid variable uh, stars, standard candle nature. And so it was different kind of stuff. And, and the Hubble Space Telescope is named after him, uh, of course, because he did yeah. that. So I, I thought it had to do with, with the Hubble and so forth. And that reminded me because you, Yoon, are working on the next Hubble up in space, but it's not the Hubble. It is the next amazing telescope, right? You have to tell us about this. I know you're working on at least two projects, so you can pick either mm -hmm. one that you want to talk about these amazing telescopes off, off uh, in the future. Hopefully not that far in the future. Yes, so I'm working on not one, but two space missions that will illuminate <laughs> the mystery of dark energy. The first one is called Euclid, named after the ancient Greek oh, mathematician. Like, like Pythagoras's pal. Yeah. yeah. And the parallel postulate um, and things like that. Well, I, I don't know that they were personally knew each other. It might have been a couple hundred years apart or something, but... Well, you know, Euclidean geometry, Yeah, right? So right. that yeah. Euclid. A squared plus B squared um, equals C squared. So, <laughs> so the Euclid mission will be launched in the first half of this July. I'll be flying out to Florida to watch it taking off. Wow. So sight. Wow. So Euclid is a 1.2 meter diameter space telescope. About four and a half feet wide. Then I also have worked on the Roman space telescope. Ah named after Nancy Grace Roman, yes. a pioneering scientist at NASA. Um, so the Roman Space Telescope, usually we just call the Roman these days. Um, Roman is a Hubble-class space telescope. It's 2.4 meter diameter. So it's twice as big as Euclid, hmm. but it's like four times as big you know, in light collecting power. Wow. So a huge yeah. bucket to collect more light in space. Roman, of course, is extremely capable, right? Yes. Just from the size, you can already tell Roman is a much more ambitious mission than Euclid, but will launch also a few years later. Mm. Okay. We expect Roman to be launched in 2027. Ah. And Roman also has multiple science goals. One of them, is yeah. to enumulate dark energy. Ah, of course. Using three okay. different methods. Yeah, so I'm so excited because I'm fortunate to have been a scientific leader on dark energy on both missions. Oh, that's fantastic. I, I can't wait yeah, to see what the results are. Through. Just just being able to go to that launch, you know, I'm reminded, Midge, you saw Columbia go up uh, its first trip. That was April 1981. Uh, that's really quite remarkable. And now, uh, coming up, like you said, this summer, uh, we're going to see this next launch of Euclid go up. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and First half of July. Yeah. So there's really amazing connections. I mean, how, how can we else can we say it? Everything is connected. And, and it's so much fun to be able to connect of like that. Of course they are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, uh, let us indeed read some poetry. Alan, choose a poem. All right. Well, so one of the poems that's that's generally in my go-to poetry section is one that I actually did a project on in school, which was which was a nice one. I, I liked this one. Um, it's a Walt Whitman poem. And Ooh. Uh, 
it's not the Walt Whitman poem that's in the book because the one in the book probably makes more sense to be in the book. This one <laughs> is, um, it's, it's also pretty well known. It's called a noiseless patient spider. Ooh. A noiseless patient spider. I marked where on a little promontory it stood isolated. Marked how to explore the vacant vast surrounding, it launched forth filament, filament, filament out of itself, ever unreeling them, ever tirelessly speeding them. And you, O oh my soul, where you stand, surrounded, detached in measureless oceans of space, ceaselessly musing, venturing, throwing, seeking the spheres to connect them, till the bridge you will need be formed, till the ductile anchor hold, till the gossamer thread you fling catch somewhere, O oh my soul. Yay! I like this one. Oh, how sweet. That was great. To- yeah, what what's your take on it, Alan? How how does it how does it sing to your soul? Yeah, well, so so Whitman is, is is very evocative of this like grander idea, right? It's it's it sort of gets to me that same idea that thinking about these vast oceans of space in actual outer space get me thinking about too, where it's like there's just so much out there, and like we're so small, and yet we're connected to this great vastness. And I think that's sort of a central idea. That's communicated both in astronomy and in poetry that we are part of this whole universe that's operating in this really mysterious way yeah. that we're trying to figure out and we're trying to find our place in it yeah and and that whole universe is part of us too right yeah it's mm-hmm. amazing that, that's that's beautiful that i think that's totally cool okay thank you so much alan um midge midge what would you like to read and again it can be from the book or it can be from somewhere else something that that evokes for us Sure. Well, I, I, I picked this one. Um, it's from My God, It's Full of Stars by Tracy K. Smith. So it's a Ooh. longer poem, and this is just an excerpt. But this is one of the first poems that I picked for this anthology. Um, when I read a poem, sometimes I read a poem, and it just gives me the chills. When you said that filament, 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 what is it from from me or from myself something like that the same thing out of it out of myself the same thing happened so this one gave me that chill and every time i read it i get the same chill from it so and and before you start one more thing the reference to my god it's full of stars that comes from uh 2001 a space odyssey um i believe it's in the book version i don't know if it's in the movie version but there it's it's what the astronaut going through this monolith thing is first comment is about it it's amazing how much more i'm learning about my own book just tonight listening to all of you (laughs) (laughs) explain her poem and now you've told me about the title which i don't know how i didn't know that but now i know astronomy helping poetry all right or (laughs) sci-fi in this case but that's okay it all counts it all counts okay please go ahead read read this again again it's tracy tracy k smith and uh yeah Mm -hmm. it's her her father actually worked on the hubble So this is a poem about that. When my father worked on the Hubble telescope, he said they operated like surgeons, scrubbed and sheathed in papery green, the room a clean cold, a bright white. He'd read Larry Niven at home and drink scotch on the rocks, his eyes exhausted and pink. These were the Reagan years when we lived with our finger on the button and struggled to view our enemies as children. My father spent whole seasons bowing before the oracle eye, hungry for what it would find. His face lit up whenever anyone asked, and his arms would rise as if he were weightless, perfectly at ease in the never-ending night of space. On the ground, we tied postcards to balloons for peace. Prince Charles, Mary Lady Di, Rock Hudson died. We learned new words for things. The decade changed. The first few pictures came back blurred, and I felt ashamed for all the cheerful engineers, my father and his tribe. The second time, the optics jibed. We saw to the edge of all there is. So brutal and alive, it seemed to comprehend us back. Wow. (laughs) <laughs> that's great and it's so true oh my gosh mm-hmm. uh 
I remember I was at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center uh, on the day before it was announced that Hubble's original optics had been ground perfectly to the wrong shape. And just hearing and feeling all those folks who had spent their careers, their, their adult lives working on Hubble, and then the feeling uh, in the other direction when the fix was installed a few <laughs> years later and the jubilation. <laughs> The mm -hmm. whole MVP. different switch. Oh. Right? You, you and you remember that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Who can forget? <laughs> That's quite a roller coaster, right? One of the interesting things about so, of course, you can enjoy each poem by itself, but then when they start to appear near each other and you read them, so there's a poem by Edna St. Vincent Millay. It's about a hundred years earlier. But she's wow. describing almost the same feeling where she's looking at the sky and she's getting this sense of like infinity and 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 she talks about the sky holding up a glass and it's it's like it's presaging the idea of Hubble you know looking through this glass wow. at the sky and even further back people who say oh I don't have you know in the 1600s I don't have strong enough sight to see out there it's sort of amazing watching how the each each person each poet wants this kind of sight but as the technology progresses they're getting better and better sight until you get to this Hubble poem Wow. So wow. every poet in every generation sees further than the previous, and yet they're still searching because they still haven't found mm -hmm. what they're looking for. And no, I'm not Bono. <laughs> Anyhow, that's just beautiful. Thank you, Midge. What a great choice. Yun, up to you. What do you want to do? You've already read your poem in the anthology, so choose somebody else's or choose a poem of yours that you've done uh, on some other context, please. Oh, I thought since you read your translation of the little Nibai poem, yes. I can read my little translation from my Sudonpo translation book. Wow. Also four lines. Wow. So tell us excuse a... <laughs> to re read some poetry in Chinese. <laughs> no, tell us, remind us all who we don't know who Su Dongpo was yes. and how Su Dongpo's poetry differs from that of Li Bai. Because they were they're written centuries apart, weren't they? Su Dongpo was from the Song Dynasty. He was actually heavily influenced by Li Bai. Ah. Um, I think if we want to name the three, not two, three greatest poets in Chinese history, He's the third, ah. Li Bai Du Fu and Su Dong Po. That makes total sense. And so this is like two poems because I think the Tang Dynasty poets really push the regular meter poetry to its peak, you know. But in Song Dynasty, they began writing poems which were uneven and which were written as lyrics to tunes. Oh. So they're really quite lyrical and beautiful, you know, Ci. Yes. Yeah, so we call them Lyrics, three in Chinese. Right. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, so this poem is called, and you said also it was short, so I'm excited. And we want to yes. read your, after you read the Chinese, we want to hear, hear your yeah, translation. So it's, it's called To the Tune of the Sound Pass and Mid Autumn Moon. So first I'll read the Chinese, then I'll read my translation. Yang Guan Qu, Zong Qiu Yue. Mu Yun Shoujin Yi Ching Han Ying Han Wu Shen Juan Yu Pan Sushen Tsuye Bu Chang Hao Min Yue Min Yan Ho Chu Kan Mid Autumn Moon Dusk clouds vanish as a crystal chill blooms, the moon's jade plate turns against the soundless Milky Way. This life, this night, is a flower about to fade. Where will we see this lustrous moon next year? So that's a very wow. short, the shortest poem in the book. <laughs> wow, that's wonderful. But, but you know, in its brevity, it covers the whole space, right? Longing, 
uh, distress, the way that you, you, the way that you translated it, it has a very different rhythm from the Chinese. And yet it feels like the same poem because, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what I strive for. So thank you for saying yeah, that. Yeah, it's amazing. Life in the universe, right? Yes. So short, transient human existence, you know, against the soundless Milky Way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it even reminds me of uh, Salvatore Quasimodo, who is an Italian poet who also won the Nobel Prize in the mid-20th century. I don't know if you're familiar with that particular poem, uh, it's so short, right? Ognuno sta solo su cor della terra, da fito di raggio di sole e te subito sera. Everyone is born at the center of the world, pierced by a ray of sunlight, and suddenly it's evening. Love that. <laughs> Brilliant. It's an amazing, right? These folks, they, they mm -hmm. write these amazing poems and the, the shortness of it almost contributes to the to the communication of the ethereal, the the brief. Mm -hmm. uh, it feels great. And and they're short, so you can remember them, you know, which is super helpful, <laughs> at least to me, because I have a hard time doing it otherwise. It's true. I think shorter poems are easier to relate to yeah they're also more memorable right if it's a striking poem if it's too long then no one will remember it but if it's <laughs> short enough you'll have multiple fans reciting it. yes <laughs> do you remember useful tip for po aspiring poets <laughs> <laughs> do you remember yoon uh lieutenant commander data's poem about his cat spot from star trek the next ah. generation Vaguely, um, <laughs> it was I terrible. It was horrible. <laughs> Midge, do you remember that? I, I know you. You know your. You know your Star Trek and Star Wars pretty well too. I, I do. I remember him doing it. I don't. Do not remember the poem itself. Oh yeah. Oh, because it's a terrible poem. See, <laughs> we do not memorize terrible poems. But that was the That's point, fair. right? They they were trying to sort of make fun of the fact that an artificial intelligent creature. Uh, was trying to write poetry, uh, following mm -hmm. rules and so forth. Now, at that time, he had not uh, found or installed his emotion chip yet. So he was trying to mm -hmm. tell it using rules and uh, the Latin name of what cats are and things like that. It was just <laughs> like, and, and the point was, it was so bad, but doggerel and uh -huh. humans and, and kind of fun, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, um, Midge, go ahead. I have to say that my some of my poet friends have been having fun like asking the the um, AI to, to write sonnets and uh, oh. they, they come out following the rules and you know, <laughs> that's terrible. It's like a plastic mannequin of a sonnet, you know, it's, it just doesn't <laughs> anything about what the real poem is. So we all feel a lot, we all feel relieved that we can't quite be replaced. <laughs> <laughs> Alan will be a little while, well, hopefully. A Alan, Alan, can, uh, can you find, um, the the fellas catus poem that data wrote uh, it's, it's in the chat it's in the chat so oh, 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 our, oh. Uh, producer people put it in the chat oh perfect read it for us read it for us or at least I, I some think, of it it's really long we should not read the whole thing it's not it's not good okay. <laughs> just start just start a little bit <laughs> uh the, the beginning is Felis catus is your taxonomic nomenclature an endothermic quadruped carnivorous by nature <laughs> So, uh, yeah. It's so bad. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, D Dana's working through his humanity. That's so. right. That's right. And, yeah. and, and therein lies that art point, too, right? Because although we're meant to laugh at it, it also mm -hmm. is, is a way that the writers were trying to communicate this person, just as you said, Alan, working through their humanity and, and yeah. getting there at some point. You know, I don't know if there was ever a follow-up episode that actually had that poem in there, but it would be so fun. It would be so fun. Uh, uh, if we could go on for hours more, I would, but we really can't. We need to wrap this up relatively <laughs> quick. So this is what I'm going to do. Midge, the Walt Whitman poem uh, that I, I want to end with. Um, before we get to that, I, I have to ask you, which poem from Robert Frost did you include in the anthology? I know you could only include one, 
from each poet. But which one did you choose? And, and, and it's a trick question because I know which one you should have included if you had all the freedom to put in whichever one you want. That's just my personal opinion. But I just wanted to know what you choose. What, you, what did you choose from Robert Frost? So I chose a poem called The Star Splitter. And oh. <laughs> I have to say there, I mean, there are, are lots of things beyond just the poem, unfortunately, that control what I could include in, ter- in terms of public domain and, and um, fees and things like that. But totally this understand poem, that. Uh, but yes. This poem does have the, I mean, I think this might speak to an astronomer's heart that a man burned down his entire house for the insurance money so that he could buy a telescope. Yes. <laughs> That's how much he wanted to understand his place in the universe. So Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so so okay, I, I totally respect that. I'm cool with that. I would not burn down my house because although I love the universe, I would prefer to sleep indoors. But <laughs> I'm just saying, if you guys all ever get a chance to check out Choose Something Like a Star by Robert Frost, which is written in iambic tetrameter. Again, one of my favorite meters. Sorry, Shakespeare. The fifth, the pentameter, just one uh, foot too long, in my opinion. But but that's just me. That's just me. But uh, that's a beautiful poem, and and we'll we'll go for it some other day. Uh, but the poem I, I wanted to end with and have you all sort of think about it and comment on it, and then I would give you my take of of what it means, uh, is from Leaves of Grass, Walt Whitman, and it goes something like this. When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I, sitting, heard the astronomer where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon unaccountable I grew, tired and sick, till Rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself into the mystical moist night air, and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. Midge, talk to us about this poem. Well, uh, (laughs) I think I told you a story that when we launched this book in Cambridge, the director of the Institute of Astronomy was there, and I, I, I had that was Kathy Clark, right? That's right, Kathy Clark. Yeah. And mm-hmm. she, um, each reader could pick a few poems from the book to read. And as I offered her this, I thought, oh no, that that poem's in the book. How embarrassing! I hope she doesn't <laughs> notice it, or she'll think I'm insulting her. And then she sends me back her list of poems that she wants to read, and that was one of them. And she, <laughs> and she introduced it, saying, you know, sometimes astronomers can be a little boring and uh, <laughs> <laughs> all inside and look at the stars so I I am glad that I'm glad it finds a place among astronomers as well as poets <laughs> Alan that's good Alan your take as a as a fine amateur astronomer yourself uh... yeah I mean you know there's nothing cooler than than watching someone when they first see Saturn's rings through a telescope mm-hmm. or Jupiter's moons to a little bit of a lesser extent. And then just even even without a telescope or something, just pointing out to someone like that is the planet Venus. And they're like, whoa, you can see the planet Venus just with your eyes? That's so cool. And I'm like, that is the best because you really gain an appreciation for how the solar system is and then also for how people view it and how much they're excited about that kind of stuff so yeah look up at the stars you need to do that (laughs) yun what do you think i must confess i used to hate that poem (laughs) but now i feel differently right because it's framed in midge's book you know i think now i have a new perspective Hmm. um so yeah i don't hate it anymore you know so now i think it's (laughs) It's a fine poem, you know, about a different perspective. Mm-hmm. Sorry to say, I still don't love it. <laughs> it's yeah, really it's okay. <laughs> so, so let me tell you my take on this. Um, I was introduced to this poem by an astronomer, David Malin, who included it in one of his books about the universe. David Malin, a tremendously talented astrophotographer, as well as a researcher in Australia. 
And uh, David put it in his book just by itself, Walt Whitman, and I, I read it. And the first impression I got when reading it was kind of like what you thought, Ewan. I was mm -hmm. like, young man, get back into my classroom. What are you going outside for? Sit down, sit down. I'm not finished yet. You know, that was my original thought. But then I, I tried to think about it some more. I said, well, if, if David included it, and, and an amazing astronomer uh, is David, uh, let's figure out why. And then it came to mm -hmm. me. The first four lines, the narrator is being passively shown astronomy. Mm -hmm. I heard the astronomer. The, mm -hmm. the proofs were ranged before me. I was shown charts and diagrams. I sitting heard the astronomer. It's a passive way of absorbing the universe. The last four lines are active. He grew mm -hmm. tired and sick. He didn't want to be passive anymore. He rose up. He glided out into the air. And then he looked with his eyes. So yeah. the, the answer mm -hmm. really is that. Walt, Walt Whitman is well known uh, in, in most literary circles as being very anti-intellectual. He, he disdained mm -hmm. formal education and so forth. That's so, what I reacted right, to, right. I think. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he and I part company on that. I think there is a place for formal education and a place for informal education. But in the end, the idea that when you want to learn about something, and especially something as grand as the universe, right? Mm -hmm. You want to do it actively. You want to go out and seek it. You want to look you want to see stuff. And then maybe you reach that idea uh, that Alan was talking about, right? That looking and seeing, wow, that's so cool. Or as Midge, you know, saying that, that Kathy Clark was talking about, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, sometimes so listening is really boring, but go out and do it. <laughs> it's pretty yeah, awesome. Yeah, so now, now I can read it almost like a cautionary tale, right? How not to... <laughs> Teach astronomy. Uh, teach people about astronomy so that they're bored to tears, right? Yes. So that <laughs> now tying in with the theme of this chat, right? Yeah. Poetry is a perfect vehicle for teaching astronomy. It absolutely. <laughs> no is. charts, no columns, <laughs> just poetry. Yeah. And as we have shown, astronomy teaching poetry. Now, who is the author of that Olbers Paradox? Uh, poem that you read earlier, Midge, because because I want to go find that and and find other other authors uh, like that teaching astronomy via poetry. T tell me who that is. That poem, Olber's Paradox, is written by Robert W. Crawford. So not to be mistaken with Robert Crawford, the um, Scottish poet. This is an American poet. Midge, give us the name again of that book and its press uh, so that we can find it, please. The name of the book is Outer Space: One Hundred Poems published by Cambridge University Press. And if you want to learn more about it, it's at cambridge.org slash outer space. Wow. Is there any other way we can find you and for, learn what you're doing with Euclid and the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope over the next period of time? Is there somewhere we can be in touch with you, Ewan, and, and follow all your cool science and poetry? People can simply Google my name, Yun Wang, then cosmology, then they'll be taken to my website. Okay. Why you... Where I have links to everything I work on, including poetry and Euclid and the Roman. Wonderful. Into your search engines, everyone. And Midge, <laughs> Midge, how can we find out more of what you've done? I mean, we've barely scratched the surface, right? You, you've written mm -hmm. your own poems too, even though you were too humble to include your own poem into this book, I believe. <laughs> Tell us how we can find your work and what you do. Well, I have a website, midgegoldberg.com, and it has a it has my poetry books and different events that I'm participating in, both online and in reality. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Midge, Yoon, thank you so much. Uh, please come back again. We have so much more to talk about, so much more to discuss about our work and what we love to do and our poetry. Well, not my poetry, your poetry. <laughs> thank you again. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. Thank you. No, thank you. It has been an honor and a pleasure. Also, so much fun, as you can tell. I really enjoyed myself. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. This was really great. Alan, as always, thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for being with us today. If you like what you see and hear, please support us. Find us on Patreon. Or otherwise, follow and enjoy all that we do 
here in the Ludiverse. Thank you for being a part of the Ludiverse. <laughs>